do have um, some of the notes for tonight there, as well as the passage. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and open to Romans chapter 13. Um, so chances are, if you're friends with me on Facebook or you follow me on Instagram, you saw a couple weeks ago I was posting some pictures um, when I was in Universal. Um, I was in Orlando, um, especially a lot of pictures of me with like the T-Rex or the Velociraptor, because if you spent more than five minutes with me, or if you've seen the back of my minivan, you know I kind of like dinosaurs more than a little bit. Um, but when Ben and I were in Universal um, in Orlando, we weren't there for the theme park, we're actually there for a conference. Um, my husband's a youth pastor, and so we were there for a conference called Youth Pastor Summit, but it was as much for me as it was for him. Um, and the last speaker of the conference was a man by the name of Bob Goff. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of or read the book Love Does, um, but I hadn't read it myself until after um, the conference, and I was just so captured by what he had to say that Ben handed me his iPad where he had the book, and I read half of it on the flight home and um, stayed up way too late the next night to finish it, um, because he talks about love in such a radical way, but it's so simple and yet so profound, and we're going to be talking about that in Acts chapter 13 tonight as well, um, but quite simply... Love does. And I don't know about you, if you can think about a situation or um, a thing that God has prompted you to do, but you were hesitant. Uh, maybe you know that you're supposed to talk to this person, or you're supposed to do this thing. Maybe you kind of talk yourself out of it. I know when I was a freshman in college, um, there was a group that went to South Africa on a missions trip every year. Um, actually, it was over spring break. And um, you know, I, I didn't have much money. Uh, my parents were going through a divorce, so they weren't really able to support me in any way either. And so I decided not to pursue it, even though it was pretty obvious that God was laying that on my heart. And I let myself be intimidated by all the obstacles instead of remembering the greatness of God. Um, I lost sight of the fact that love does, in spite of the obstacles, and is obedient to the thing that God calls us to. So I would ask you to find that thing and focus on that as we talk tonight. Whatever that thing is that you've been kind of avoiding or that you've been saying no to Jesus to or you've been saying later to Jesus about, you're like, some other time. I mean, you haven't seen my class schedule. Well, he probably has, actually. Um, well, no, you, you don't know all the things that are going on in my world. I'll do that later. I'll do that another time. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. It says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Um, so that was verses 8 through 10. So the first thing that I want you to realize is that love does love selflessly. Basically, that's the entire idea of this section of scripture here. If we are loving selflessly, then keeping these commandments is going to be no problem because you're not going to go kill somebody if you're loving them selflessly. You are not going to steal. You are not going to harm another person. And I also love that it says to owe no one anything because loving someone is the debt that can never be paid. There is no end to that. You've never loved someone enough that you don't need to love them anymore. God tells us, when you've loved them as much as you think you can, keep loving. Because that is the example that he has set for us. If we are loving to others, these commandments are a non-issue. Um, commentator John Stott said in his commentary on Romans, love needs law for direction, right? So how are we supposed to love? Well, you look to the law, and it, it guides you in some things that you're supposed to do, in ways that you are supposed to love people, or what you're supposed to not do in order to love people. But the law needs love for its inspiration. Because if you take the law and you're just doing these acts but you don't have love, it's not an inspired action, right? And we've spent so much time in the book of Romans talking about the law and what the law looks like with our faith. And I love that Paul is bringing it in here and he's saying, so you want to keep the law in a way to, to serve God? Love. Because that loving selflessly is going to help us live in a way um, that is pleasing to the Father. Another quote that I read in a commentary, it says, it is easy for us to love people in the theoretical, if I can say that word right, and the abstract, but God demands that we love real people. See, it's one thing for us to talk in our small groups or at Catalyst about loving people, and it's an entirely different thing to actually do it. 
And I would challenge you, how often do you actually practice the things that you talk about and that you study? How often do we live out the things that we're told to do here? When God prompts you to do something, do you just sit in your comfort zone or do you act on it? And Bob's book, Love Does, is just an entire book of this crazy man doing crazy things because that's what love does. It means sending flowers to the person that actually wronged you. It means listening to someone's story even though you don't really comprehend or understand. It means going above and beyond because selfless love does that. The next thing that we're going to see in verses 11 and 12 is that love does live presently. Paul tells them to wake up. Besides this, you know that the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. It doesn't just say the night is gone. It says the night is far gone. The day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. I love that Paul says the armor of light. See, we're not just supposed to be clothed appropriately for what it is that God's calling us to do. We're supposed to be clothed in armor because we're not just called to, like, a life of sunbathing or a life of leisure and comfort. We're called to battle. We're called to be intentional. He tells us to wake up. See, you can't be engaged, present, and connected if you're sleepwalking through life. He doesn't want us to walk aimlessly and absently or apathetic. God calls us to passion. He calls us to purpose. John Stott again said, the Christian life is not a life of sleep, but of battle. And I would ask you, are you living a life asleep or awake? Paul goes on, he tells us to get dressed. He says, cast off darkness, put on light. But guys, we have to cast off before we can put on. If we're trying to put on the robes of Christ before we've cast off our filthiness, our unrighteousness, our sinful nature... We're still clinging to those things, and we can't let the righteousness of Christ press against our skin. Spurgeon says the rags of sin must come off if we put on the robes of Christ. There must be a taking away of the love of sin. There must be a renouncing of the practices and habits of sin, or else a man cannot be a Christian. It will be an idle attempt to try and wear religion as a sort of celestial overall over the top of old sins. We need to wear the appropriate clothing. When you go on a float trip, I'm guessing that you're probably not wearing a parka. If you are running a marathon, you're probably not wearing slippers. If you're going to a job interview, I imagine you're not wearing a prom dress. If you're going to the career fair, chances are you actually put some effort into what you're wearing and what you're doing. God calls us to be intentional and to dress for the occasion as well. And guys, the occasion is to put on the armor of light. The next thing I want you to see in verses 13 and 14 is that love does live with integrity. And Paul tells us to walk. Verses 13 and 14 says, Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I love how broad the spectrum of sin is that Paul addresses here. I mean, it's some things that pretty obviously are like, I mean, that's obviously kind of a huge no-no for Christians. But then he throws in there things like quarreling and jealousy. He's saying you need to deny all of the spectrum of things that are not pleasing to God and live the way that he's calling you to because love does live with integrity. We need to live appropriately as a follower of Jesus. I know sometimes there's decisions and choices that I make that maybe I kind of hope my parents aren't going to find out about. I'm like, mm-hmm. I know you would not be pleased with this. How much more so for, for God? Would we be pleased for him to know because he does know all of the choices and the decisions that we make. We need to properly behave appropriately, and not because we're trying to earn his favor, but because we want to please him, because that's what love does. So Paul lists all of these different things that are not appropriate for a follower of Christ. So I want to challenge you, what does this mean for you? See, love, real love, it's going to act. It's going to do, and it's going to do the hard things. Because really loving people selflessly can be dirty. It can be exhausting. 
It can push you past your breaking point time and time again. But I'll tell you, whenever I have like wandered into prayer to God and I have been completely battle weary, my armor may be tarnished or maybe like kind of falling off. You know, those like cartoons where it kind of like falls off and then it clatters to the floor. But I know that my God is pleased with that because that's what love does. Love does love selflessly. And you can't do that if you're putting yourself first. Love does live presently, and you can't do that if you are not aware, if you are not present, if you are sleepwalking through life. Love does live with integrity. And you can't do that if you are putting sin first instead of your Savior. Now, I know that this is Holy Week, and maybe some of you have been thinking about it a lot. Maybe for some of you, like, homework's just been really crazy and incredibly distracting. But tonight's a really special night, because tonight is the night that we remember and that Jesus first initiated taking communion. He broke bread with his disciples, and he shared with them about things that they weren't fully comprehending or understanding. He was telling them, guys, pay attention, because this is what love does. And he was going to make the ultimate selfless act of love and lay down his life so we had an opportunity for relationship with him. And so you have the the elements at your tables to take communion. And when uh, they come up to do worship, we're going to just do one more song. I want to challenge you to take a moment before you take communion and think about what love did on the cross. Because guys, he dies tomorrow. But then on Sunday, we know already what happened, and we celebrate his resurrection and his defeat of the grave and the fact that he paid a debt that we could not because it was unpayable because that's what love did. And so before you take communion, think about those things. Thank God for those things. Thank him for his ultimate love. But then after you take communion, I want to challenge you to think, so then what is my response to this? Because if I am identifying myself with Christ, which is what you're doing by taking communion, he's telling you you need to do more than sleepwalk through life. So I want you to think about what action is he calling you to? What thing that love does do you need to step up on? That thing I asked you to think about earlier that you're kind of like, "Mm, God, maybe not. Like, you know, I can do that later. Maybe you should do it now. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you so much for your ultimate love. God, I thank you for loving us in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. Um, Like the song sang a moment ago, Um, you love us so infinitely beyond anything that we can imagine. God, I praise you for the sacrifice of your son. And God, I ask that out of obedience to you and a desire to please you, that we wouldn't make an excuse to not do anymore, but that we would let love do, that we would be obedient to you and live selflessly and with integrity. In Jesus' holy, holy, holy name. Amen.